If you will open, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 13. While you're turning, let me just take a moment. Quite a number had requested copies of the sermon from last Sunday evening. And all that we had prepared were sold. And uh, there are now additional copies out at the media center that you can get when the service is over. Also, tonight I'll be preaching another one of my favorite sermons. And I'll be preaching tonight on things made white. I hope that you'll be here to share with us. Reading together, beginning at verse 1 through 10, and then verse 18 of Revelation 13. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his, upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of saints. Verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, threescore, and six. I'm sure that of all the numbers there are in the world, there is no three numbers put together that are more identifiable than the number 666. And today we come to look at that one whom the scripture declares is to come into this world. The beast from the sea, the coming Fuhrer. In the 1930s, the German people were in despair. Economic depression was shaking the foundations of industry. Millions were out of work. Small business enterprises were collapsing. It was a desperate time. It was into this world that Hitler came. The people were looking for a way, perhaps any way, out of the situation they were in. And Hitler saw the opportunity to pursue his putsch in precisely the area and the era of history that was demanded. Thus his power and this power mad leader of the Third Reich propelled himself and his evil empire onto the scene and into control of Germany with a design to create a world empire. In this chapter, we're introduced 
to a coming power who displays many of the characteristics that Hitler and all other despots who have become dictators have in common. A thirst for power, a lust for control, a magnetic personality and capability of leadership that will make the dreams of the people a reality. Could the world be on the brink of a new Fuhrer? Are we ready for the Fourth Reich? The First Reich, if you're a student of history, you're aware that historians refer to the Holy Roman Empire, that first century empire of the Rome, of the Romans, as the First Reich, where the Caesar became known as God, where because of his benevolence and the benevolent uh, attitudes and the laws and other things of the Romans, though they were conquerors, they reached out to and brought into uh, their control a people who were thankful for the blessings that Rome brought with him. And so it was that over a matter of time, the Caesar was acknowledged as divine and people all over the world worshipped him as God. The Second Reich is referred to as the German rule of 1871 through 1919. We know that the Third Reich was the rule of Germany under Hitler from 1933 until 1945. I believe there is coming a Fourth Reich a fourth dimension, if you would. The fourth dimension is known to all of us and yet is unknown to all of us. The fourth dimension is a spiritual dimension. The third or the third dimension has to do with the things of height, depth, and width. It's a mathematical declaration. It's a, what we see with our eyes and what we're able to hear with our ears and what we're able to touch and feel with our hands. The third dimension of all that is a part of this world. But some scientists think perhaps there is a fourth dimension. And they say that it is a spiritual dimension. And I am convinced in my own heart as I study the Word of God, that there is being planted in the hearts and minds of people today a desire for some sort of spiritual power that will come into this world, that will have the answer for all of our needs, that will give men food to eat where they're hungry, that will care for the environment, that will cause political strife to cease and peace to be given, and so men the world round are reaching out to someone or something that will be able to answer that. Our scripture says there is coming a man who is going to have that capability, who is going to appeal to the governments of the world and to the peoples of the world. And in what I'm calling the Fourth Reich, he will establish a worldwide rule that will call all nations, tribes, and people underneath his command. And for three and a half years, he is going to give the world everything that they have been dreaming about, all that they thought could never be, as they sought for peace, and there was no peace. But in the midst of those years, in the last three and a half years of that seven-year period, that one who has gained the attention of the world and has been lifted to power, he is going to break his pact of peace with Israel and instead of peace, he will give war. Instead of plenty, there will be famine. Instead of the promises that he has made before, now he will command that he be worshipped as God. He is going to set up a statue of himself in the temple that will be built in Jerusalem. And the heads of the world's governments will come to Jerusalem, the holy city, and they will bow there and they will worship this man, declaring that he is God. 
the mindset of today's society, the spiritual condition of today's religious climate, and the chaotic conditions of world politics is creating the seedbed of humanity which is being readied for the rule of the Fuhrer of the Fourth Reich. While Jesus refused the temptations of Satan to receive the governments of the world himself, this man who is coming will accept the offer of Satan and will grab control of the world's governments and will usher in a satanic ruler and a one world empire. How far is that down the road? How soon is that going to come to pass? I do not know. The scripture doesn't tell us. But he says that we who are the people of God are to be able to read the signs of the time and thereby be able to know when things are coming to pass. Now let me tell you that from this text, there are 20 things about the beast that you need to see. Now you won't be able to write all these down. You may want to get you a copy of the message later. First of all, he will be a man. Secondly, he will rise out of the sea, and the sea representing humanity. Thirdly, he will become ruler of the seven kingdoms symbolized by the seven heads. Fourthly, he will become ruler of the ten kingdoms that are yet to be formed inside of the old Roman Empire. Fifth, he will be a blasphemer. Sixth, he will revive the old Grecian Empire. Refer to Daniel chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 17 to see that spelled out. He will have characteristics of the Medo-Persian and the Babylonian empires. He will receive his power and, author and great authority from Satan. He will seemingly be assassinated and then resurrected. He will have all the world wandering after him. He will be an object of worship. He will be a supernaturally gifted orator. He will be given power and success for 42 months or three and a half years. He will defy God and claim to be God himself. He will make war on Christians and Jews. He will be given power over all nations inside the ten kingdoms of the reformed Roman Empire. He will be worshipped as God. He will have a religious uh, leader in the false prophet. He will permit image worship of himself. And 20th, he will cause the mark or emblem of his kingdom to be branded upon the right hand or the forehead of all of his followers. Thus the stage is being set for this man of sin, the son of perdition, to take control of the world stage. How is this occurring in our time? Now you need to understand what I'm about to share with you is what I see going on around us today. A man was going to a masquerade party and he decided he would go as the devil. And so he went out and rented him one of those red devil suits with a uh, a long forked tail and he had on a mask and he had a pitchfork in his hand and he started out to the meeting site for this masquerade party. As he was walking along, it started to rain and he said, I do not want to get this suit wet and ruin my entrance at the party. So he saw a building that was open and he ducked inside of a church to get out of the rain. Well, as he went in, people saw the devil, and they started running for their lives. Out the back door, out the side door, out the front door, through the window. One woman, in her attempts to get away, had her purse strapped to hang over the end of the pew, and she was stopped from her flight. 
And the devil was trying to say to all of them, don't be afraid, this is just a charade. But she, thinking that he is the real thing, said, oh, please, Mr. Devil, please. I know I'm a member of this church, but I've been on your side all of the time. I think in our world today, more people are pledging allegiance to Satan than they even begin to realize they are. This is not the rantings of an old fogey who does not understand things about life, but rather I am looking through the eyes of God and His Word as to things that He says are going to be. So how is the religious atmosphere declaring that we are looking at the coming of the future Führer? First of all, to give you a big word, because of the existentialism of today's world. Existentialism is a German philosophy that came into being and it says man is the commander of his own life, his decisions and his future. We are a result of our environment and of our decisions. What you decide is what you will become. So out of Germany there came this attitude that has now manifest itself all across the world and especially here in the United States of America. If you have been beyond high school, you have been exposed to what is called the critical analytical philosophy of theology. That simply means that there is a group of people who think that they are able to look at the Bible and they can tell uh, that the Bible is not divinely inspired. They can say and do say that uh, uh, you cannot depend upon what the Bible says. They say, for instance, that the first five books of the Bible were not written by Moses, but they were written by a group of priests over a long period of time who were identified by the letters J, E, D, and P. They say that the book of Jonah is just a, a, a religious uh, poem, a narrative that was written by somebody in order to express what was his own thoughts. The book of Daniel, they say, is a pseudepigrapha. That's a big word. Go home, look that one up, if you will. A pseudepigrapha means that it was written by someone, but they chose a well-known name in order to give it authenticity. And they say that uh, this book was written after Jesus' lifetime. The professor who said that to me, by the way, doesn't the Bible teach us that we ought to be able to give an answer to every man concerning the faith that is within us? That professor presented that and he said the book of Daniel was written 45 years after Jesus, not in those Old Testament times. I raised my hand. I said, that's a miracle. He said, what do you mean, Mr. Jones? I said, well, it's amazing that Jesus quoted from the book of Daniel, which was written 45 years after his life. He had never thought about that before. It is not what these pseudo-intellectual theologians say. It's what the Word of God has to say. And we who are the children of God need to understand that. But these supermen who claim to know more than God, they question the inspiration of the Word of God. They question the authority of the Word of God. They question the historicity of the Word, and they question even the necessity of the Word. And so we have two things running now. One says you can become and will be whatever you decide. You're the captain of your own life. Secondly, we don't need the Bible because it's just a compilation of myths and other things. And by the way, if you don't believe that much of the world 
is buying into that, then you don't understand what's going on around about you. Thirdly, out of this kind of philosophical and theological atmosphere, are you taught in public schools what is known as situational ethics that base life on the premise, if it feels good, do it. Now I want you to know, folks, that every parent here today has a bigger job than you understand. Because while you're trying to teach your children one thing, the public school is teaching them something absolutely opposite of what you believe. They have them for six hours a day. You have them for about two hours of waking time. And most of us are spending our time watching television or going out to a ball game with them or doing something else rather than teaching them the things of God. Now I need to stop at this moment and say to you, every parent here today with young children as well as us old folks, you ought to make your way to the media table, get you a copy of the daily devotional material that is prepared for you, take it home, sit down with your family, read the Word of God, memorize the Scripture, and make sure that you're teaching your children the ways of God. If you don't, you're assigning them to the devil and to the devil's crowd and turning their eternal soul over to him. Now hang on because I'm going to hit that again before I'm through. A Christian movement that is moved from the search for truth for the Bible to life, now there's, we're moving from life to the Bible. By, and what I mean by that is this. In most of the pulpits of the land, and I want you to know that I am old. I want you to understand that I know that the method of my preaching is not what is going on in the world today. I know that most fellows wear a golf shirt and sit on a stool and talk to the people. And I'm not going to say that you can't teach people that way because you can. But I do want you to understand, dear friend, that the problem they have is that they are finding a situation in life and they're trying to deal with that and then out of that situation, they're looking for some scripture that will make it fit. In my Sunday school class this morning, it was pointed out, a friend of one of my members has gone into an, uh, a, another religion. And uh, they have their own uh, version of the Bible and they keep changing it every time something else changes. And so uh, these are folks who... Uh, they too have tried to make the Bible fit, uh, or rather, yeah, make the Bible fit them rather than them fit the Bible. Now I want you to know, dear friend, that we do not have in our hand the ten suggestions. They are the ten commandments. They are the words from God. They are given to direct your path. They are given to keep you in safety and in purity. They're given to bring you to God both here in this world and prepare you for God in the eternal world that is yet to come. And we who are the people of God need to understand thus saith the word of the Lord. And anything that I have to say does not amount to anything if there is not scripture to support what I have to say. I don't have a message unless God gives it and I have no authority except the word of God. But we're living in a world where men are moving away from that and they come to church and they bounce beach balls out and back during the song service and they have a high old time and they come in and say that they have worshipped and then go right back out and live like the devil. If your religious experience and worship did not affect you enough to change the way that you live on Monday, you risk what God had in mind on Sunday. Well, there ought to have been more amens than that, but I'll take that to mean that those are old me's. So the Christian movement itself is falling into a methodology 
that is preparing the minds of the world's people to accept a coming fury. And by the way, while I'm there, I'll just make the rest of the world mad. Pope John Paul II violated his own church's beliefs and rulings over and over again. I've got it. I can show it to you. But, for instance, he held hands with a Buddhist and said a Buddhist can find God by seeking the enlightenment that Buddhism brings. You rub the belly of Buddha and you'll bump him in hell. He prayed in the mosque and said that all of our Muslim friends and brothers will find God for Allah and Jehovah are one and the same. <laughs> Not so. There is one God and His name is Jehovah and His Son's name is Jesus Christ. And without Jesus, folks, I've got news for you. You're not going to make it to heaven. You'll come to the Father, Jesus said, through me. No other way than that. And so one after another, I don't have the time to spell it all out, but I want you to know he was an ecumenical pope who said that everybody is just in the same boat. Now before you get too hard on the pope, you might ought to turn on TBN which some of you do. And you're watching trash on that thing who are saying the same kind of things. Throw your doctrine away. If you don't put doctrine in your kid's heart, you're going to lose your kids to the devil and the world. If you don't have something to stand on, you'll fall for anything that the devil throws into your path. The mindset of this day in its religious community is being prepared for the coming of a Fuhrer and the world will worship him as God. Wow. Where does time go when you're having fun? The mindset is being prepared by the acceptance of the occultic world. Well, now that I've made most everybody mad, I'll get the rest of you while I'm here. All around us, the minds of men are being prepared to accept a superhero kind of guy. I thought cartoons were for kids. But I'm finding now that uh, the people who have been brought up on the television generation, that cartoons are their way of thinking. I mean, who ever would have dreamed 40 years ago that Bart Simpson would be the top television program. Who would have ever thought that adults would go to a movie and pay 10 or 12 or 14 dollars to get in to watch Batman or Catgirl and that with his powers he can fly or that Superman would be believed. Hey, the mindset, the mindset is being prepared to accept that kind of a superhero that the Bible says is coming into the world. By the way, is it not strange that suddenly a few years ago, everything on Disney has been uh, tainted by a belief in uh, witchcraft and uh, in the other mystics like that so that uh, people uh, and, and young people are buying into that. Why do you think that so many of them in our schools today are already drifting into the world of witchcraft. And if you don't know that, friend, you don't know what's happening on our campuses. There is not a campus in America that does not claim to have at least one witch. And when you see the kids going to school and they're dressed in black and they've got their fingernails painted black, and they've got all these other signs and symbols. That's the Druid world. The Druids were witches, folks. Don't miss that. And parents, you need to be smart enough to understand that 
snatch that stuff off of their body, dress them in clothes that are ordinary and acceptable, and teach them the things of God. Witchcraft, my friend, is forbidden of the Lord, and yet we're buying into it every day in our world. So the mindset, you say, oh, preacher, you're against Mickey Mouse. I'm not against Mickey. I got a Mickey Mouse watch, I'll have you to know. <laughs> it's a collector's item. But I want you to understand that not just Disney, but all of these other things, you, begin, you need to begin to look and see how young minds are being programmed to accept the things that the Antichrist is going to introduce into this world. While I'm there, the church of Satan, the fastest growing church in America, is not the Baptist church, nor the Assembly of God, nor some of the other denominations. It's the church of Satan. They are being drawn in by the thousands. And you know what their music program is? Listen to this now. It is acid rock. Acid rock and Satanism are in the same camp. And everybody who is in that, and I mean everybody who is in that, I've studied it. I've talked with the law enforcement people about this. I've read everything I can find on it. And acid rock, they declare that they have Every album that comes out has been blessed by a witch. And they have asked that uh, they might be given the praise. They have sold their souls to the devil for the blessings of popularity and uh, of, uh, of money. They are into that kind of world. Now coming on the heels of that is uh, the gangster rap kind of stuff. Parents again. Young people, let me, I'm not going to put that on the parents' shoulder. You as young people need to be strong enough to say, I'm not listening to that. I'm not going in that kind of world. I'm going to separate myself unto God. I'm going to be pleasing to God in all things. And I don't care if the whole rest of the world is rapping and, uh, and, and rocking. I'm not going to give myself to those things that are destructive to my soul and the souls of those around me. The American court system is a part of what's going on. First of all, they outlawed prayer. Then they outlawed God and kicked Him out of our campuses. And by the way, they're now outlawing Christian holidays. No longer Christmas holiday, it's now winter holidays. And no longer are you going to be hearing about Easter, it's going to be Just spring holidays. They've even outlawed the Easter bunny. Now that's saying a mouthful. How did this come? By the way, Senator Charles Schumer of New York said on May the 1st, 2004, in a Senate Judiciary Committee session, that J. Leon Holmes was disqualified as a candidate for a federal judge appointment because of his deeply held conservative religious views. He's a Catholic. Schumer also said of Alabama Attorney General Bill Pryor on June the 11th, 2004, that Pryor's beliefs were so well known, so deeply held, that it's hard to believe that they're not going to influence his decisions. So he's disqualified from being a judge. Dianne Feinstein of California also opposed him on those same grounds. Former Supreme Court Chief Justice Charles E. Hughes once said, quote, We live under a constitution, but the constitution is what the judge says it is. What they're saying is, we as judges will rule America and we will not allow anything other than a liberal-leaning, liberal-minded person as a judge. Folks, we'd better wake up in America or you're going to find that everything that you have held high and holy is going to be gone from us. Now, who is this Fuhrer? The question is not necessarily who he is, but what does he do? As we read our scriptures, we find that he blasphemes God. From Jerusalem, the holy city, 
He's going to set up His image in the temple in that last three and a half years of the, of the tribulation and demand that everyone will worship Him. If I read the Scriptures correctly, my friend, the United States President and the leaders of countries from around the world will board their jets and fly into Jerusalem and they will bow and they will worship this God who has set Himself up just as the, just as the Caesar of Rome did and demand that He be worshipped. Secondly, Daniel 8.23 says that He's going to be able to understand mysteries. All of those things that have been such a hard thing in life to understand. He's going to have the answers. Wouldn't it be good if we had somebody that just had all the answers to all the problems that we face? Here's a superman who is going to claim that capability. In Daniel 8, 24 and in Revelation 13, 17, the Bible tells us that he is going to be able to perform miracles. You see, folks, it's not only the people of God who believe in and can perform miracles. The Bible says that there are those in the church world who have the gift of miracles. But this man is going to distinguish himself with such occultic powers that he will be able to perform miracles and people who are looking for something that will mystify them are going to flock to him. Then he will control the money and commerce of the world, verse 17 of our text says. He will rule for 42 months, will be finally defeated, and then cast into the lake of fire. He is a man of significance, a man of sorrow, and a man of sixes. Six, six, six. He is on the scene. I've said to you already in another sermon, I believe that Antichrist is alive and well on planet earth. I believe the time of his appearing is soon at hand. And we who are the people of God need to be aware of what's going on. But I want to say to you, and I'm here to announce today, I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for the Christ. I'm not looking for the one who is going to take over this world. I'm looking for the one who made this world. I'm not looking for one who is going to rule here. I'm looking for the one who has the authority and power and rules all over heaven and will one day rule all the kingdoms of the world. But I'm not looking for one who's going to show up and show out for seven years. I'm looking for one who is going to be worshipped forever and forever by the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is alive, by the way, and bless God, he is coming. He is coming back for the church. And the church of the living God ought to be so aware that he may come today. Hey, did you know that he might? He just may come today. I, I know, he can. If he's waiting for an invitation, I already have knelt right there this morning and asked him to come. I'm ready for him, aren't you? I'm telling you, there's not a thing in this world that I'll have or hope for that would keep me from wanting Jesus to come back today. By the way, when I'm gone, the keys to my car will be in my pocket. Drive any of them you want off of the lot. They belong to you. If you're still here. I hope you're not going to be here either. Yes, sir. And you won't have to fight my wife for the bank account because she's leaving with me. Amen. Yes, sir. We're going to the big party together. Thank God. What are we to do? Read your Bible, friend. And give your absolute devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. Parents, teach your children in the home God's word and God's ways. And get them to the house of God. By the way, I make no claims, but I do report what one of our sisters, actually three of our people said as they left the service last Sunday. One of them pointedly looked at me and said, Preacher, I've learned more from you since I've been here in this two years than I learned in all of my life in Sunday school before. Bless God. You see, folks, I want you to know not what I believe. I want you to know what the Word says. And I believe what the Word says, so they go together. And so we need to teach. We need to teach our children. And parents, you need to reach your children while you can. For the day is coming when you will not be able to.
What do I mean? So listen now. If you have a son or a daughter who is not a Christian and the rapture comes and you're caught out to be, meet with God, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Bible says that when the church is gone, the Holy Spirit who now restrains evil is going to be taken out with us. And when the restrainer is gone, all hell is going to break loose on this earth. And when that happens and the Antichrist is, is introduced, those who are left on this earth, did you hear that? Those who are left on this earth, they're not going to believe what mom and daddy tried to teach them years ago. The Bible says that God's going to send a strong delusion upon their mind. They're going to have a, a, a cloud put over their brain. And they're going to believe the lie of the devil. They're going to believe that the Antichrist is the Christ. And they're going to follow him straight into the pit of hell. And if you love your children, you need to be praying over them. You need to be agonizing before God for their souls. You need to be warning them and teaching them and seeking to bring them to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's some in this room today that it ought to disturb your sleep and you'll not be able to rest tonight because you've got a child, a son, or a daughter, or you've got a husband, or you've got a wife, or you've got a mother, or a dad, or you've got a brother, or a sister, that you don't want to go to hell, but they're going there. And we need to know that unless we can reach them today, they could fall forever into hell. They're going to believe the lie that the devil is going to teach them in that day. You say, preacher, I've never heard that before. I'm not surprised. There's not a whole lot of preachers that will tell you the truth. But you read it in the book of 2 Thessalonians. It's there very clearly that they who are left on this earth are going to believe the lie of the devil. And friend, if you're here and you're not saved, don't you put off until tomorrow what you need to do today. Don't you put off to another time what you know Jesus is saying to your heart and life. You need to give him your heart. Give him your life today. The Fuhrer, the future Fuhrer, the ruler of the Fourth Reich, who is going to claim spiritual authority as God himself, is soon coming on the earth. And we who are the people of God need to warn and we need to flee to him who is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, our musicians prepare for the time of invitation. I know that there are those in this room today to whom the Father has already spoken about your relationship with God and about your relationship with the church. In a moment when we sing, I'm going to ask you, as God has spoken to you, that you'll respond and make your way to the altar, coming to confess Christ, coming to lay your heart and your home on the altar, coming to put yourself into the church where you might be a servant of God and glorify the name of God. You say, well, preacher, I'm saved and I know it. I am too. But I want you to know, friend, if I wasn't a part of this great church and I lived in this area, I'd want to be because I want the devil to know I believe in the church just like I believe in Jesus. And you ought to come in that response, putting my heart, putting my life in the Lord and in his church. If you're here, you're not ready to meet Jesus. If you thought, if you knew that Jesus was going to come this day, wouldn't you want to get everything straight between you and God? You want to get everything under the blood? Then let's do it this morning while God is speaking to you. Spirit of God, I've brought the message the best I know. I stumbled and I faltered, I know. But I proclaim the truth of your word. And I pray that the people today now will be drawn by you, the Holy Spirit. And may they respond according to your directions. I pray for that man there. Lord, I've lifted him so many times, but I pray for him again. I pray for this brother here. I pray for that sister there. I pray for that couple there. I pray for this sister. Lord, before my mind, their faces are lit up in my understanding. And I pray that they'll respond to your touch and your call as we wait before you here at the altar.
Hear us, God. Hear us and move in our midst. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow.